I'd be, I'd be fascinated if your account of how Dole got put on the ticket in 76. And what the, well, what I need you, I, I'll be glad to uh, discuss what I know about it. I, I, I need to tell you, I was not, at that time, I was not uh, in, the, in the inside group uh, in terms of selecting the vice presidential nominee. I was the delegate hunter for uh, President Ford in his um, contest for the nomination uh, against uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, and so I don't know what all the inside uh, uh, discussions were. Uh, I've read, uh, like you have, that uh, there were a number of people on the list, that there was, uh, at an early stage, uh, a decision was made because of the opposition of the state Republican chairman from the South to replace the vice president. In retrospect, I'm not sure that was the right uh, decision to make, and I've always believed that if Ford had uh, had kept Nelson Rockefeller and or uh, put Reagan on the ticket, particularly put Reagan on the ticket, that he would have won in 76. And I've had many discussions one-on-one uh, -on -one with, with uh, Ronald Reagan about that when I was his chief of staff. I write about those in this book that I'm going to that I'm going to give you. Now, having said all that that's no in no way a knock on uh, on Bob Dole it's just that I think the election was so very very close that either one of those two uh, scenarios could very well have given us what we needed which was only another 10 or 11 thousand votes well you know that's fascinating because the story at least as I've heard and I'm sure there are variations of it was at the time that there was such bad blood between the Ford and the Reagan camps. There was. And th that people had been told, Ford wanted to visit Governor Reagan once the nomination was closed. The deal was, Richard, we had an agreement that there would be a unity meeting. Whoever lost would, uh, would, would meet with the winner in order to bring the party together for the general election. That, just, that, that uh, agreement was made between the campaigns before the convention. After the convention, and Ford won, uh, on the, particularly on that critical 16C vote by only 30 delegate votes, we went to the Reagan campaign and said we need to, after the nomination, need to have a unity meeting they said we'll be delighted to have a unity meeting with you provided you agree in advance you will not offer uh, governor reagan the vice presidency and um of course, the Ford uh, camp didn't want to do that anyway. It had been a very, very bitter primary. Uh, Ford didn't want to offer it to Reagan, and Reagan didn't want to take it. But I've had I've had at least two or three conversations uh, after that when I was President Reagan's chief of staff, one on one with him in the Oval Office, and I write about it in my uh, recent book, uh, in which I said, you know, Mr. President, if um, if uh, President Ford had offered you the vice presidency uh, and you had taken it, you might never have been president. He said, I understand that, but he said, I have to tell you, Jim, that if he had offered it to me, I would have felt duty bound to take it. Uh, I also note that Paul Laxalt, who was very close to uh, Governor Reagan, has a different take on it, which was that he didn't, that he in effect winked at his campaign and said, I don't want it. You let him know I don't want it. But the President, but President Reagan was very, very upfront with me about it. You know, he's not, he's guileless, and he, what you see is what you get with President Reagan. And I do not believe that he was playing games with me, but it's an interesting uh, thing to, uh, to think about. Had you had any contact with Dole before the '76? No, I, I had had no, I'd had no real contact. Of course, I'd not done any national politics before '76, when I became the delegate hunter for the Dole, for the Ford uh, Dole. Uh, ticket actually it wasn't it wasn't the Ford Dole, Dole ticket delegate hunter for President Ford in May of '76, uh, and it was during that uh, time and then after the nomination when I became the general chairman of the President Ford Committee and Dole was on the ticket. That's when I had my first uh, experiences with uh, Senator Dole. Uh, I, got, I got in trouble right away uh, in, in one respect. I was doing an interview 
uh, shortly after I became general chairman of the effort. And, and the question was, how has the campaign <laughs> coming? Are you happy with the way things are developing? So forth and so on. I said, yes, but I said, we need to do a better job uh, with our vice presidential uh, effort. We're not doing uh, what we need to do there. And, and uh, that was interpreted by, uh, by the senator and I think by Len Knopfseger, who was uh, assisting him at the time, to be a knock on them, which it wasn't. It was in effect, I was in effect saying we need to give them more support and we need to create a better uh, number two effort. Uh, <laughs> that, that was a very brief little uh, contretemps, didn't last very long, but, but uh, Bob Dole worked, worked very hard as the nominee for, uh, for President Ford and did a very good job for the ticket in my view. That said, he did take some knocks. I mean, the very fact that the that the race was as close as it was. Yeah. Um, he took he took a lot yeah. of heat. Yeah. The um, Democratic Wars comment. Exactly. That's I mean, one. Do you remember? But, yeah, well, yes, that, I, rem I, mean, I remember that. I remember that. But I want to tell you, um, in a, in an election that close. There, there are 2,000 things that you could go back with 2020 hindsight and said if this hadn't happened or that happened or this hadn't happened, the result would have been different. In my view, that did not cost uh, for the the election. That comment by uh, by Senator Dole, uh, it was it was promptly uh, repudiated. But it was the only thing I, that I can remember that. Uh, uh, that was seen to be a negative uh, with respect to his uh, effort as the vice presidential nominee. I need to I need to tell you that um, I worked really closely with Bob when uh, I was chief of staff for President Reagan in the first term, and he was um, uh, in the Senate initially uh, as. Minority as a majority whip, maybe was didn't wasn't he? Uh, at one point, he was majority leader when we were working with That's him, right. and I think that was maybe when I was at Treasury and we were doing tax reform, and Bob Dole was indispensable to uh, that number one domestic priority of uh, President Reagan's getting enacted and into, how the right. enacted into law. Well, he'd been on the Finance Committee for uh, quite a while. He'd been involved in, in uh, those issues. He was an extraordinarily good legislative tactician. Bob's, Bob's um, signature way of, of greeting you in, in, uh, over the telephone when he'd call me when I was chief of staff, he'd, he'd say, how are we going? That's what he would always say, how are we going? Which means what's going on, how are we doing? And, uh, but he was, he was as good as it, legislative strategy as anybody I dealt with in the 13 or so years that I was in Washington in, the, in either as chief of staff uh, at the White House or as Secretary of Treasury or Secretary of State. He was magnificent and, and was a very good majority leader when he took over that post. Explain that because I think most people have very little understanding of how Congress works. Well, it's convoluted. It's that's what's the old saying? You don't want to watch. It's like like watch, watching sausage being made. It's not, not any fun to watch watch the way our laws are made. But it's uh, but you have to be able to build consensus. You have to be a leader. Uh, I always called him leader. That was my term for. I didn't call him Senator Dole or you know Bob or I just say Lee. I called him leader, and of course that was the name of his dog. If you remember his little schnauzer, his and Elizabeth. Elizabeth worked for me in the first Reagan White House. She was the assistant uh, to the president for public liaison when I was chief of staff. So I had a, a close relationship with them. Uh, was it? Did that ever create an awkward situation? The only I only had two awkward situations with uh, with Bob Dole. I've already mentioned one of them to you, which was when I, ma I made the comment intending to be saying that we, we needed to beef up our vice presidential effort to help that effort, and it was, uh, I, think, I think it was misinterpreted, and it was 
quickly forgotten. The second was in the, the uh, presidential debate, the primary debate in Nashua, New Hampshire in 1980 when uh, Bush had negotiated a one-on-one -on -one debate with, with Reagan. The Nashua Telegraph was going to sponsor it. The Nashua Telegraph wanted it to be one-on-one -on -one and they didn't want to they didn't want to open it up to the other candidates. The Reagan uh, campaign was smart enough to say we need to have the other candidates included. They all showed up there. Uh, President Bush, I mean uh, Ambassador Bush, was stuck to his word. He was true to his word to the Telegraph that it was going to be one-on-one. -on -one. And she said, no, I won't open it up. I told him it would be one-on-one. -on -one. As far as I'm concerned, it ought to be one-on-one. -on -one. And that's when uh, they all went out there, marched up on the stage. And President and Governor Reagan said, Mr. Breen, Mr. Green, Green, he said, I paid for this microphone, and the guy's name was John Breen. But he took that line right out of a movie script that he'd been involved in. But coming off the stage, I was standing at the bottom of the stage that, that evening. Coming off the stage, Bob Dole came down and he took his forefinger and he punched it in my chest. He said, I'm going to tell you something, Jim Baker, you will never I will never forget this. You will never live this down. Well, it went away after. I mean, but he was quite upset about it. That's the only time there was ever any uh, tension whatsoever, uh, serious tension between uh, Senator Dole and me. And we worked really, really closely together and well together to uh, to um, produce the. Uh, legislative gains that Ronald Reagan was able to achieve in his first term, which were quite remarkable. Well, in fact, that brings up, I mean, he was pretty much a good soldier. I mean, no one for a moment believed that he had uh, converted to supply-side economics. That's correct. And yet, he, he was, he, but yet he was, but he, he, he helped us, and he, he was a damn good soldier, uh, and, and he was always there, and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't playing, and playing his own game or his own agenda, playing stuff on the side the way you see so often in politics, and particularly in uh, Washington politics. Uh, and I'm sure that there were things in tax reform. I can't remember the specifics, but there may be, again, there may be some of that in this, uh, in this book I'm going to give you. But there were some things in tax reform, I think, that Bob was probably not particularly enamored of. He might have felt, uh, I, don't, I don't know this, but he could very well have said, wait a minute, we can't cut these marginal rates this much uh, and expect to uh, deal with the deficit because he had a, he was concerned about the deficit. Now we all know and we all know that yes, he was a deficit hawk. But and, and but nevertheless he went along with the Reagan program and we now know that in uh, retrospect it worked. The program worked. The supply side economic theory was was validated and vindicated in the aftermath of those uh, major uh, reductions in the top marginal rate that Reagan was able to achieve. Then of course in the second year he comes back with uh, Tefra, with the, uh, the sort of the, the attempt to take back a few of the Christmas ornaments. Well, we were, uh, yeah, but that wasn't just Bob Dole now. That was Jim Baker, his chief of staff of the White House, and and uh, practically all of us in the White House, including Ed Meese and Mike Deaver, and in the final analysis, Nancy Reagan. And let me explain to you why that happened. We had campaigned on a, in 1980 on a platform to reduce uh, taxes by $500 billion. We got into a bidding war with the Democratic House within the, in the person of Tip O'Neill. Neil and, and Danny Rostenkowski, and we ended up cutting taxes by $750 billion. At a time when the economy was really sick, uh, we'd inherited stagflation from the Carter uh, years, and, um, and you remember what happened in 82, 80, late 81, 82, early 83. I mean, the president's approval rating went down to 37%, to and, and we were beginning to create these humongous deficits bigger than the country had ever seen before as a percentage of GDP. And a number of us, including Senator Dole, thought we needed to do something about that. So we finally convinced, after a lot of tough <laughs> discussions, finally convinced President Reagan to go with something called TEFRA, which was a, a, a tax 
in effect a tax increase designed to recapture that 250 billion that we'd cut taxes uh, over and above what our campaign promise was. And the president wasn't happy about it. I never will forget him finally agreeing to do it, taking off his glasses and throwing them down on the Oval Office. I said, "All right, damn it, I'm going to do it," but it didn't. But I'm not happy about it, or something like that. And we did it. And President Reagan, in, in his, in the, I like the last book he wrote, or last uh, one of his last memoirs, said it was uh, probably the worst decision of his presidency, and he shouldn't have done it. And I'm inclined to agree with him, frankly. Yeah. I, yeah, well, I think so. I don't. I don't think that got us. I don't think that, now maybe politically, maybe at that time politically that was a, a good thing to do and it bought us, it bought us a little bit of time, but you don't, you don't reduce the deficit by raising taxes because Congress is going to spend that money on other things and in the absence of spending restraint, you will never reduce the deficit by increasing taxes. One interesting asterisk to that though, uh, one very well placed old staffer. Uh, told me, they sat in a meeting with Paul Volcker, where he said point blank, if you do this, I will lower interest rates. That there was a quid pro quo. Well, there was no doubt about that, and that would have been the position of the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve. He would like to have seen, uh, particularly at that time, seen some revenue uh, increases, some uh, yeah, you know, did did we get did we have a commitment that if we did TEFRA we'd get uh, some interest rate reductions? I don't remember that. I was chief of staff of the White House, so I wasn't at that time. I wasn't Treasury Secretary, uh, so it may be that that happened. I, I can't vouch. For, I don't know of my own personal knowledge that it did. But at the time, politically, it probably was the right thing to do. But substantively. I think it was a mistake to raise those taxes, but to recoup what we'd cut beyond what we promised in the campaign. This is a sidebar, but I have to ask you, in retrospect, should the president have let David Stockman go instead of taking him to the woodshed? Uh, well, I'm, I, I'm still of the view that he did the right thing by taking him to the woodshed because the damage had been done and we needed somebody. David Stockman was the only guy in there that knew the numbers and knew the the substance of the of the budget and the detail that he knew it. So I think that uh, I don't think it would have. Uh, I, I think we would have had a lot of trouble trying to find a an OMB director at that critical time in the process. No, I think it was the right thing to do at the time. Social Security reform, right, is a you know monumental achievement and obviously a perennial topic of discussion. Uh, well, Bob Dole was involved in that too. In, you know, he was right in on the you know, in on the takeoff and the landing on what we did in 1983 to save the Social Security system. And it's the only time it's ever been done, to my, to my knowledge, uh, uh, in, and in the only way it can be done. This uh, current administration, uh, under 43, uh, decided because they had a Republican House and a Republican Senate and owned the White House that they were going to muscle Social Security reform through. You can't, it's, you can't do that. Social Security is the third rail of American politics. Anybody who touches it gets burned and burned badly. Bob Dole certainly understood that. Howard Baker understood it. Jim Baker in the White House understood it. That uh, commission that we formed, I think the idea of the commission even was, uh, was suggested by Republican senators, uh, among them Howard Baker and probably Bob Dole. Uh, it used that, that commission, uh, uh, the Greenspan Commission we called it, met in the basement of my home on Foxhall Road and we fixed Social Security for 30 years. And we only could do it because we got the, the top of the Democratic Party and the top of the Republican Party both together behind the effort so that we could take it out of politics so one side wouldn't use it against the other. Uh, Bob was instrumental and extraordinarily uh, vital to that effort. What, what are his skills? In a, in a situation like that. I mean, some people have talked to me and said, it's almost, I mean, I suppose any great legislative leader has almost a, a sixth sense. It's a, it's a psychological instinct about exactly when 
two people. He knows when to move. Well, he knows he knows where to move. He knows how to move. He knows when to move. I mean, he's as I as I told you. I I don't think I've ever and I work with a lot of them in my 13 years up there in various iterations. I don't think I ever worked with one who was a better legislative leader. He was superb at that, and he he knew how to bring the disparate uh, views together. He knew how to appeal to to people from the far left and the far right of his own caucus. You know, you think about Jim Jeffords from uh, of, uh, of Vermont and Jesse Helms of North Carolina. You you're talking about two different breeds of cat there. You think the humor helps? Good, wonderful. He, he very, very. He had a wonderful sense of humor. Still does, of course. Yeah, and it helped tremendously. And what a what a spectacular uh, political career. Uh, you know, a nominee of his party for both vice president and president of the United States. He could have probably stayed in the Senate uh, until he died if he wanted to. It's interesting. Do you have a theory, you know, it's been trotted out over and over again every four years, that in the 20th century at least only two presidents were elected directly from the Senate, and only one has ever been directly elected from the House. Do you have a theory as to why legislative leadership doesn't seem to translate I think it may be because, uh, first of all, executive leadership is something that you can uh, you can crow about a little more when you're running for president because you're running for an executive position. But also, legislative leadership means shaving at the edges and and uh, and bringing and, and seeking consensus and getting consensus and. Cutting edge issues oftentimes are what determine campaigns. Uh, and that's why I think, and furthermore, uh, legislative leaders, whether it's the House or the Senate, they're out there voting every day, on, in f six or eight times a day, and they're leaving a paper trail, and they're leaving, uh, and they're leaving a trail that their opponents can, uh, can pull things out of and use against them. Uh, and, you know, that's one of the reasons I think legislative leaders don't do too well. I wonder if there's one more factor that, you know, so much of the modern presidency, Harry Truman said, is all about persuasion. And, and there's a kind of legislative language, which is almost a foreign language, and it's almost like you're in a bubble. And Dole would uh, be accused often of going out on the, the trail uh, and, and speaking in this kind of shorthand, legislative shorthand, which no one in the audience. no one else really. Right. That's right. But to him, it was second nature. Yeah, right. I think that that's, there may be something to that. I, I don't know. He, he had a tough go when he was nominated, though. He was nominated in 96. Uh, had to run against a fairly pop, extremely popular president. It was a tough deal. Let me ask you, the lead up to 88, um, Reagan, at least in public, appeared to be scrupulously hands off. Uh, almost to a degree where, I mean, I wonder if, the, if those of you in the Bush camp were, uh, were concerned uh, to any degree. I mean, well, we would have liked, we would have liked to have seen more. Um, a more, a more, uh, a, a quicker and perhaps more robust uh, endorsement. But it finally came. It came in time for us to uh, make good use of it. Uh, but I remember when I resigned as Treasury Secretary in August of 88 to go over to run that campaign, uh, thinking, well, now, you know, shortly after Labor Day, we get the president, the president will, and will step forth and he'll give a ringing endorsement of his two-term vice president, because they were really close by then, you know. They're, they'd had a difficult primary, too, but it was eight years ago, and, and George Bush had been, a, had been a perfect vice president for Ronald Reagan. Uh, but it didn't come until a little bit later. <laughs> it finally came, though. It's interesting if you go back even to '72 and the whole the, the RNC chairmanship and when Dole was dumped and, and Bush uh, took his place, you had this series of events really beyond either man's control that had made them rivals, and in some ways that climax in '88, which was. You know, as we yeah, that was remember, it was a pretty uh, heated pretty and uh, occasionally even nasty uh, campaign. And there were some, must have been some real resentments that lingered for a while. And I want to talk about that a little bit, but, but I'm setting up, I wonder if, if those in the Bush camp then had any doubts 
over what kind of Senate leader Dole would be, because pretty clearly if they did, they were they were eliminated. Uh, well, Dole was a Dole was a, again a a perfect Senate leader for uh, George Bush number forty one. I mean, I can't think of one thing. And I was Secretary of State, of course, at the time, but I can't think of one thing that, uh, I wasn't in the White House, but one thing that the White House wanted that, uh, that Dole didn't try to deliver. Yeah, it had been a tough primary, but I think, I think Bob is, is that kind, maybe that kind of a politician where, you know, where you, you can go out and you can be very, very engaged in a very tough, hard-fought campaign with somebody, but you don't let it uh, adversely affect your, the relationship later on. He, he was a very fine majority leader for, uh, for the Bush presidency. And I wonder if that actually, it curiously isn't one of the, one of the uh, hallmarks of successful leadership in Congress. I mean, I know I've heard him say so many times, you, know, you can't afford to, to, to make enemies, but I have enemies. I mean, it, it's basically, all right, you may be adversaries on this boat, by the next one. Well, I think Bob Dole was, was a part of the, uh, was a, um, was a um, Jerry Ford, Tip O'Neill, type politician where you could fight like hell during the day and then at uh, five o'clock in the afternoon you have a drink of Irish whiskey and tell Irish stories. I mean, that's the way it used to be when I went up there in 75 and of course Bob was there a lot earlier than that, but that's the way it used to be in Washington. It wasn't as ugly as it is today and it wasn't a zero-sum game. You could fight like hell. You could be an adversary without being an enemy. You could disagree agreeably. It's almost impossible to do that today. The country is so evenly divided and, and uh, politics is such a zero-sum game. And I think the country is, is worse off for it, frankly. We don't have the, uh, you don't have the, the consensus building. You don't have the uh, reaching across the aisle by either side. How much of the media is responsible for that? I think the media, the growth of the media is uh, a large contributing factor. I've said this, again, I've said, I say this in this book. Uh, when you got when, the advent of, of the cable uh, stations and then you get the internet and then you get the bloggers out there and the bloggers can write anything they want to with, that, with impunity, throw it up again, the mud up against the wall and see what sticks. And somebody will read it and they'll go with it. And you never can, uh, you, you know, you can never erase something once it's out there in the public domain and in the public consciousness. So I think the increased competition for among media outlets is partially responsible for it. Another thing that I think was very, very damaging was the independent counsel law where it became uh, fashionable to uh, do whatever you could to get your opponent indicted. That was the best way to, best way to get elected and you didn't need to do much on the independent counsel law except make a credible allegation against somebody at a particular level in government and they ran the risk of being indicted. I mean, it's just terrible. But fortunately, we're beyond that now. I know one thing. I know President Clinton has got to be uh, plenty sorry that he ever, ever, uh, ever signed a renewal of that law. And the parties too have have have, have if not moved to the extremes, seem to to have much less of a vested interest in that kind of consensus seeking. I mean. There are large elements of both parties for whom consensus is almost a dirty word. That's right. It, well, it, it suggests the sellout of principle it's, and something. Yeah, like that. it's right. Pragma pragmatism is a dirty word. Well, it shouldn't be. Why? It shouldn't. Be. You don't. Pragmatism without principle is the dirty word. But pragma principled pragmatism should not be a dirty word. Getting things done. I again, I keep referring to this new book of mine, but. I write in there the number of times I would be uh, sitting there with, with Ronald Reagan talking about legislative strategy. And he would tell me, Jim, I'd rather get 80% of what I want than go off the cliff with my flag flying. People think he was a hardline, uh, you know, hardcore conservative who never compromised. Baloney, he was a superb negotiator and compromiser and a real pragmatist. It's interesting, the notion of principle pragmatism raises this, this whole question. Because while the media 
uh, tended to focus on the differences between Dole and Bush, particularly in 88, the differences of style and temperament, background. I sensed, and particularly once President Bush was in the White House, I sensed that what they had in common in many ways was much greater than what divided them. Partly they were the, it was the World War II generation, there right. was a cultural affinity there, but also they basically were, to use your term, principled pragmatists who believed they the were. point of governing was to get things done. That's right, they were. Exactly. And in foreign policy they, they saw eye to eye, there's no doubt about that. Uh, there was a difference in their background that uh, came out in the primaries that was, you know, discussed in one of the campaign issues, I think, that was out there. Uh, the idea somehow that, uh, that Bush came from a, a life of privilege and, uh, and uh, Dole did not. But that was a purely a primary uh, campaign issue that didn't really have the resonance, I don't think, or didn't cut the way uh, I think it was hoped it would. Were you surprised by the Iowa caucus results in 88? Uh, uh, well, you know, um, let me think back a minute, because I get 88 and 92 and, oh, sure. and yeah. 84 the, all mixed up. With Pat Robertson uh, coming in ahead. Yeah, of yeah, that, we, that, that Bush lost to Robertson, yeah, I think, we, I think that was quite a surprise. Uh, of course, I didn't go, I didn't uh, leave Treasury to go over the campaign until August of 88. Yeah, I, I now remember that uh, I think I was very surprised that the that a two-term incumbent vice president would have been blown away by a televangelist in, uh, in Iowa. Probably shouldn't have been, but I was. And then, of course, you had that one week before New Hampshire mm -hmm. when uh, almost day by day you could you could literally track the fortunes of. I mean, by the by Thursday and Friday, Dole's poster was telling him, "You're in. You're going to be president." And uh, is that right? Is that what was happening? Oh yeah, happening? Dick Worthland. Literally, Worthland. Yeah, Dick. Oh, Dick. Dick. That was Reagan's poster. Yeah. yeah. Told him on Friday mm -hmm. that basically it's in the bag. I didn't know that. And Dole was maybe I'd heard that. Dole was suspicious. He just mm -hmm. didn't didn't feel. Right, mm -hmm. and of course, over the weekend it just turned around. Governor Sununu played a very significant part in all that. There was the ad that was put on the air suggesting the dole was mm -hmm. unreliable on the issue of tax taxes. Taxes, yeah, man, yeah, yeah. Uh, I did right. Well, see, I was, I was still Treasury Secretary. I don't remember being that intimately involved in the in the primaries at all. Uh, but I, I didn't know that, first of all, I'd forgotten, maybe if I ever knew, that Dick Workman was uh, with Bob's pollster. And secondly, uh, I didn't know that he'd ever said that, that uh, Dole would come. So did, what did Bush win New Hampshire by? Not too much? Oh, no, actually, it did. It was almost a blowout. It was. Yeah. Well, there was a debate on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And there was this effort, classic modern media politics mm -hmm. to, to get Dole to sign the no tax pledge on camera. I think Pete DuPont may have been behind it anyway. And uh, he wouldn't do it. And it crystallized, mm -hmm. of course, a lot of the, the back. That's so he did by refusing to sign yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was, but it was just a lightning fast, this, this bulge, mm -hmm. you know, within 48 hours of Iowa. Yeah. And then it Boom. just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, that was so it only lasted a week. Yeah. Wow. Well, but Bob and Bob came in second in the Iowa caucus, right? No, no, no. The Dole won the Iowa caucus. Oh, he did. And Robertson came in second. Robertson came in yeah. second. Sorry, I mean, yeah. And Rand and Bush came in third. Yeah. yeah. Dole won it, as a matter of fact, quite handily. Yeah. So that's right. I don't think that was too much of a surprise. I think everybody anticipated that Bob Dole would win the Iowa caucus, didn't he, at that time? Yeah. I mean, that's where his slogan was "One of Us." Yeah. That's yeah, where that Kansas, kind of cultural yeah, yeah. affinity kicked in. Do you remember the? Uh, primary debate that year when uh, when Pete when everybody was jumping on Bush because he was the vice president and uh, when Pete DuPont said something and and, uh, and George said let me well now let me help you with that Pierre do you remember that? That's <laughs> turning the tables. <laughs> Must have felt good. <laughs> um, in, in the uh, picking a vice president in 88 because uh, all, all sorts of names were mentioned. Yeah. Um, 
Well, here's what I say on that, um, and again, I get into that a little bit in here. I think it was either going to be uh, a dole or quail, and uh, and uh, people jumped all over the quail pick because of what happened to quail later on, and not because of the '88. In '88, uh, it's pretty hard to fault that selection. Uh, because Bush won all but 10 states. So even if he had picked uh, Bob, and I, I would have been very happy with, with uh, the senator's selection, I mean, with Bob Dole's selection. I was very close. He and I worked well together. We had worked well together and were, and were close, but that's not to say that... Uh, see, I really, again, I was not particularly involved in that selection process with uh, Bush. I had one conversation with him about it when he and I went to um, Wyoming on a fishing trip to avoid having to listen to the Democratic Convention and Ann Richards talking about uh, having a silver foot in his born with a silver foot in his mouth, if you remember that. And I write about all of that in there. But the two people that uh, that I remember as being the, the real finalist in, in George Bush's uh, selection process were Bob Dole and, and Dan Quayle. I think it was a generational thing. Uh, I think that's the main reason that, that Quayle was selected. And Quayle was being pushed pretty hard by Roger Ailes and by uh, Bob Teeter. But so that implicitly, you don't sense that there was bad blood left over from the primary fight. No, I do not at all. And by that time, no, I do not at all. There was one other candidate who took himself out, Pete Domenici. He was he was in there in the mix. Uh, Kemp was. People used to throw his name out there. I don't think that that would. I don't think he was really in the final. I think the final candidates were Dole and and uh, Quayle. And, and, and what kind of relationship, I mean, broadly speaking, did uh, did President Bush and Senator Dole establish? Um, um, were there regular meetings? Were there, I mean, how, how how did the relationship? Yeah, as I've said, he was. I've, I've already think I told you. I think that Senator Dole was a marvelous uh, majority leader for President Bush. I can't remember one thing that was ever that the White House uh, ever wanted. Certainly not in. Uh, in the foreign policy and national security arena, which I was operating in, nothing that we ever wanted that that Bob Dole didn't try and provide as majority leader. Uh, uh, I don't believe, you know, I don't really think there was any. Uh, I don't, I don't remember detecting any animus on the part on George Bush's part toward Dole, for, based on some things that had happened earlier on, the uh, you know the National Committee uh, uh, episode or the even the uh, Iowa up the uh, New Hampshire primary. Don't you know? Uh, stop lying. About stop lying about my record. All that stuff. I don't. I didn't detect any animus. May have been there. I just didn't detect. Yeah, it. sure. Well, that raises a sort of a philosophical question. Again, the thing I, I think they have in common, but I'm in your your comment. They were basically sort of can-do conservatives. I mean, yep. Noel, Noel came out of Western Kansas, you know, in, in 1960, a rock rim Goldwater conservative who opposed Medicare and aid education, and, and over time evolved, um, and 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 yet. <coughs> I mean, today he may have evolved, or the party may have evolved. Well, a lot of times, I mean, I, a lot of times it's both. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see. It's almost like ships of the night. I mean, I saw it with President Ford as an ex-president to the point where you know he was this dangerous radical on the left, to, you know, to to, yeah. to the newly ascendant, mm -hmm. particularly the religious right. Yeah, and and Dole was a pragmatist yep. uh, and thought there was a role for government in a lot of a lot of areas right. and i sensed it to president bush likewise that's right and and this is something they had in common but it also meant in a way they were they were in positions of power but they were they were also to some degree at least at odds with large parts of their own governing coalition i mean uh, mm. how comfortable 
I mean, for, I, I'll give you an example. I mean, when, when Noel ran in 96, he was visibly uncomfortable catering to the religious right. Thought he had to do it. You know, there's a, the Hollywood speech, and the, yeah, yeah, all yeah. of these gestures, and it never really, to those mm -hmm. of us who knew it, it never really rang true. And I thought in many ways it undercut mm -hmm. his authenticity, which I thought was a real, you know, one of the really strong things he had going for him. What have you thought about Dole? He was, he was real. Yeah. And, and some of the criticism that had been directed earlier at Vice President Bush and then the President Bush, there was a sense that th this was someone who was not totally comfortable ingratiating himself with I think it depends on how far over you what what, what that segment of the of the well, uh, right you're talking was, about um, uh, you know the, the yeah. uh, I, mean, example, I think example, President Bush example. hurt himself a lot when he uh, when he broke his no new taxes pledge. That, that hurt, I think, in terms of his position with the right. Was that the origins of that? The, the conventional wisdom is it came out of, of the convention at a time when you were behind in the polls, needed to. Were you talking about uh, uh, read my lips? No yeah, read my lips. Oh yeah, that happened. Uh, when we started out, well, when I left Treasury, we were 18 points behind. I don't think I, I think I left Treasury after the convention, didn't I? Yes. I can't remember. The 88 convention. I left it just days before the 92 convention. I remember that. I left state yep. just days before. But I think I left Treasury uh, after the. I don't remember any de any debate about read my lips. I mean, I wasn't I was not involved at right. that time, so I don't remember. I guess the question I, I'm asking is whether the demands of getting elected, in that case, of drawing a line in the sand between you and your opponent, very effectively, in some ways, came back to haunt uh, the president in the White House when he decided, and I think most historians think rightly and, 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 and credit him with the courage of the decision that something had to be done about these ballooning deficits. Um, I mean, it was an act of, it made them want to be suicidal, but it was also incredibly <coughs> courageous. What he got, what he got, of course, was some spending restraint, which then, then didn't pan out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you think, in retrospect, it was a mistake to uh, the, the budget deal? I don't think it was a mistake substantively, uh, but I think that he didn't give sufficient uh, consideration to the um, to the extraordinary political cost of doing that, because because it had been such a complete read my lips, you know. Yeah. I think it hurt him. Well, I know it hurt him, with him and, and uh, because, you know, it helped fuel the third party candidacy of Ross Perot, and he got 19%, and two thirds of his votes came from us. We got 38%, Clinton only got 43%. You take two thirds of 19 and add it to 38, we get 51%. Yeah. I mean, we had a terrible problem. We had that, we had the economy in the tank. And uh, we had an administration who didn't do anything to, we, we should have gone up in uh, January of 92 and, and called for something called domestic storm in the aftermath of desert storm, yeah. around which we could build a campaign. We didn't do it, that was our mistake. Were you getting any advice to that effect from people like the uh, or, or? I don't remember, well I was, see I was Secretary of State. Yeah. I don't remember, but I do know there was an internal debate uh, and someone I think even made the suggestion we need to go up with something called domestic storm. But the president's economic advisors, Bush's in 92, were telling him, hey, wait a minute, we don't have to do that. The economy is coming back. And it was. And it came back in October of 92, just in time for Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Bush, Bush was an unlucky president. Yeah. Um, the Gulf War, quickly, uh, uh, and the whole lead up to the Gulf War. Uh, Dole, was, Dole was magnificent on that. Perfect. I mean, nobody could have asked for better support, more support. And, and how did that support manifest itself? Well, he helped us get, we, we, you know, we only got a resolution, we only got a, approval from the Senate 52 to 48. And without Dole, we wouldn't have gotten it. 
it was not popular at the time. We were dealing uh, with a tough situation. People forget that. And the only way we got that Senate support was to have someone like, like Senator Dole working to help us achieve it. And we went out and got the rest of the world on board so that we could go to a senator who wasn't going to support the president and say, Senator, you're not going to support the president in this endeavor, but the president of Ethiopia is going to support him and you won't. I mean, it was a very, very forceful argument, very effective argument. But the senator, but the senator Dole helped tremendously. We wouldn't have been able to do it without him. And in fact, I think the Senate vote was preceded by the UN vote. So yes, we got the UN vote. We got the use of force resolution. For, we put that unprecedented international coalition together before we ever approached our Congress for authorization. And had we not done that, we would not have gotten authorization from the Congress. And it's fascinating. I mean, there's, there's a kind of leadership that doesn't translate well to the television age. No, it doesn't. And yet, it's what presumably President Bush excelled at. Yeah, he was, he was personal diplomacy. He was terrific. He was very good at it. He was an ex you know, I don't want to. I'm not, this will sound bad coming from me because I was a part of it, but he had an extraordinarily good foreign policy presidency, effective. A lot of things happened in those four years, and practically all of them, practically all of them happened uh, correctly. I'll tell you one place where Bob Dole was quite instrumental was in uh, the Balkans, in Kosovo. He had a big, he had a, a staffer, I think, who was very interested in Kosovo, and uh, Bob was very uh, interested in that issue and involved in that issue and kept after it and kept after it until today you see there's a, a UN resolution that may very well be voted from out of the Security Council for independence for Kosovo for the Albanian majority in Kosovo to achieve independence Bob was Bob was on that issue way back when before before the uh, the Serbian and Croatian uh, wars in Bosnia Herzegovina in 92 I remember at the end of the Bush presidency, there was a, uh, I, I, I just saw it since then, there was a salute to the president, congressional dinner, as I recall, of some sort. It was after the election, before the inauguration. Before the inauguration of Clinton? Uh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And I'll never forget because both Bush and Dole were bordered on tears in talking about each other. I mean, it was, it was like, it, it, things have come full circle. And, and one sense that, uh, you know, that, I mean, a, a real bond. Well, they were both yeah. probably, a, they were both probably quite aware that their political careers were ending. And they were, as you pointed out, they were both uh, leaders that came out of World War II. And, that's you know, that may may account for that. I don't know. And yet, and yet, Dole was going to go on and he was going to go on and be the Republican nominee for president in '96. Yeah. What, what what contact have you had? I mean, after the Bush, the first Bush presidency, uh, were you involved uh, at all in the in, in, in the '96? Uh, not really. Not not extensively. I uh, I helped with some uh, un, informal debate negotiation. Uh, a strategy with uh, b both the senator and congressman Kemp at, at the at the senator's request, not as the official uh, negotiator, uh, but that was about all. I, I I took a couple of trips with him on the campaign plane. I know from uh, or from hearing him during that '96 campaign, it was tough. To go out. Oh, I did. Excuse me. Let me back up yeah. and say I also gave a, I also gave a, a, a red meat uh, foreign policy speech at the convention in San Diego at the request of the, the Dole campaign. Yeah, you were about to say something. No, I was going to say that he 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 said he came back one day and told people the campaign uh, because there were leaks, unflattering leaks. I mean, and, and I mean, Donald there were leaks. Le yeah, leaks coming out of the campaign, mm -hmm. obviously designed to make the leaker look good and mm -hmm. at the expense of the candidate. And yeah. uh, he came close to losing his temper and basically said, you know, I'm going out there day after day after day after day, you know, getting hit on the head with the polls and everything 
else and you know being being a good soldier and uh, talking up victory and it was it was it was pretty disheartening to come back to your own camp and, and find people they were leaking that it was that they weren't going to win yeah, oh, yeah. that's terrible yeah that would be terrible how do you think he changed in the course of his career and, and how did the Republican Party change? Well, that's, uh, that's beyond my uh, ability to describe, I think, uh, Richard, because I know, you know, how did he change? I, I didn't know Bob until, uh, as I told you, 76. <coughs> I didn't even know him when I was Deputy Secretary of Commerce. I knew him when I took over the Ford campaign and after he was nominated. Um, has the party changed? I think it's probably changed a lot like the Dem Democratic Party. They move more and more uh, to the fringes to do their nominating. And people who, I remember we had a county chairman here in uh, Texas way back when I first got into politics with George Bush in 1970, who was seen to be an arch conservative. And by the time I, I left politics, she was seen to be uh, a, 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 an unacceptable moderate. So, I mean, I think that's the way the parties both have changed, uh, to the left for the Democrats, to the right for the Republicans. And what will it take to reverse that? I don't know. Electoral disaster? Or, or water? Well, that, 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 that would sure do it. Uh, it maybe, maybe an end to the country being quite so evenly divided between red states and blue states. We've got to find a way to get back to a civility in our politics somehow. Where in our governance at least, maybe not in the politics, you, you know, what you say out there on the stump is generally, I think, okay, legitimate. You go back, you're a historian, you look at what's happened in the history of presidential politics in this country, and some of the things that are being said today are no worse. In fact, they're far less uh, bad than some of the things that were said in our early campaign. But in governing, you got to find a way to, to, um, work together for the benefit of the country. We've got to get back to that somehow. Do you think part of the problem structurally, and I don't mean to pick on Clinton, but the whole notion of the Clinton war room and the permanent campaign, the fact that, there are, that there's no distinction between running for office. Yeah, but I don't think that's ever been, I don't think it's any different uh, than it has always been. They, they articulated it and they pointed it out publicly and they called it the permanent war room. But that's the way you run an administration. I've been chief of staff to two presidents and you've got to be, you know, you've got to respond in hours and, and minutes and hours instead of days and weeks now in terms of the news cycle. And so you have to run it. Uh, you got to have a theme of the day. You got to have a picture of the day. You got We been. We were doing that way back in the Reagan years. Well, even Joe Ford. Ford. Ford was guard the strategy. Did, did it in the Ford day. Did it in the Nixon day. Yeah. Yeah. I think Bob Dole ought to be remembered. I think he ought to be remembered as uh, as someone who uh, served his country uh, uh, extraordinarily well. Not not just. Uh, as a military man, which he certainly did, he was a true uh, war hero, but and almost gave his life for his country. But someone who served his country uh, extraordinarily well as a public servant, and who was a practitioner of politics in the finest uh, tradition of that practice. One thing, no, it's not for this. I have to ask you. Can mm -hmm. I tell you a quick story? Do you remember if Don Rumsfeld? was at the 76 convention in Kansas City. I, I don't remember that. I don't remember whether he was, in, but he would not have been able to take a part in it because he was Secretary of Defense.